Well, hello and welcome again to our journey into number theory. And we introduced in the previous section the gamma function, which you may have come across in advanced courses in calculus. So gamma of s is an integral. It's the integral naught to infinity x to the s minus 1 e to the minus x dx. So it's an improper integral. And it converges for the real part of s bigger than 0. And we also introduced some properties of this function, in particular <coughs> the, um, this iterative formula which enables us to build up values one from the other. The fact that gamma of n plus 1 is n factorial if n is a non-negative integer. Gamma of a half is root pi and that this lovely um, formula here, gamma of s times gamma 1 minus s is pi on the sine pi s which enables us to analytically continue the gamma function to the whole of the complex plane and it's meromorphic with simple poles at the zero and the negative integers. So I want to now introduce the so-called reduplication theorem which goes back in fact to Legendre and was generalized by Gauss and this is going to be of great use to us later on <coughs> in our quest to extend the zeta function across the whole of the complex plane. So this reduplication formula so it tells us how to multiply gamma of s and gamma t and says it's just gamma of the sum of the two multiplied by twice this integral here. Now this formula is often written in the following form. You divide the by the gamma s plus t and you rename this integral here uh, as beta, or b of s and t, this is called a beta function, and or a beta integral or a beta function of two parameters s and t. Uh, we'll see, you probably may have seen the beta function in a slightly different form, and I'll mention that in a second. So here's a little proof of how this works. It's quite a nice little exercise in calculus. Here's the statement of the lemma that gamma of s gamma t is gamma of the sum times twice this integral. Now by the way before we look at the proof if we put u equal to sine squared in this integral here make a change of variable then I'll leave you to check this turns into j just in this much of it it turns into the integral from 0 to 1 u t minus 1 1 minus u to the s minus 1 du and this is what you normally see when you look up a beta integral or a beta function. I'm writing it in terms of trig functions here, but this is the usual, in fact, way of writing it in many calculus books. So the proof is not too, too difficult. It's quite a nice little calculus exercise. So um, there's our definition of gamma. It's the integral, improper integral. Um, from 0 to infinity, x to the s minus 1, e to the minus x dx. So I firstly, I'll make a change of variable. I'm going to put x as u squared. And that simply produces this integral here. So it's twice the improper integral, 0 to infinity, u to the 2s minus 1 times e to the minus u squared du. I'll leave you to check that calculation. And so when I then want to multiply gamma of s times gamma of t, I can just take two copies of this, change the dummy variable from u to v in one of them, and multiply them together as an iterated double integral. Now you've got to be a bit careful here because we're integrating, these are improper integrals, and so this is now a double integral, or can be interpreted now as a double integral over the first quadrant, in the uv plane. Now to make sense of this and to be able to do something useful with it, what we what we do is we're going to integrate over a quarter circle of radius r in the uv plane and then let r go to infinity. In other words, we're going to we're integrating over the whole of the uv plane, the sorry, not the whole of the uv plane, but the first quadrant of the uv plane. And we make sense of that by just integrating over a finite region, this quarter circle, radius r, call it s, 
and then let R go to infinity. Now you can see from terms like this here, and also the fact that we're doing this over a quarter circle, that polar coordinates will be the way to go. So I'm going to put U is R cos theta, <coughs> and V is R sine theta, and pass to polar coordinates. And that means the double integral that we were looking at, now just over this finite region S, after we make the change of variable, this simply turns into this integral. So now we're integrating. Theta is going to go from 0 to pi on 2, as we see in the picture. And the little r is going to go from 0 to capital R. And then we just plug everything in. Don't forget the Jacobian, the r d r d theta, and that's what you get. And I simply split this up now, simplify it, and split it up into two bits. You can do, you can separate off the thetas, because the endpoints are independent of theta. You can separate off the r's. This thing here, then, is just twice our beta integral. And this thing here, of course, is just the gamma integral, except now the parameter has been replaced with s plus t. And then that gives us our formula. Now we can do some um, interesting things with this one. So just as an example, that's a couple of examples to show you how one, which you may have seen in courses in calculus, you can use these formulae to work out lots of interesting trig integrals. So just as a little application of this, you can, if you wanted the integral of um, cos to the 7th times sine to the 9th, well, there are various ways of doing this, of course, but this is very neat because we can do it in one go. This is now our beta integral. And the so this is 2s minus 1, 2t minus 1. So if I add 1 and divide by 2, I get 4. Add 1 and divide by 2, I get 5. Divided by twice gamma, the sum of these two, gives me 9. Now gamma of 4 of course is 3 factorial, gamma of 5 is 4 factorial, gamma of 9 is 8 factorial, and when the dust settles on that you just get 1 on 5, 60. You can also do integrals, these are a little bit harder to do by other methods, can be done of course, but these are a little bit more tricky when you've got uh, both powers here even. Well you can do it here again, you add 1 to this and divide by 2, so that gives you 7 halves. You add 1 to that and divide by 2 gives you 11 halves. And then divided by twice gamma, the sum of these two, which is 9. And you can now use that reduction formula that we saw before for the gamma of n. So gamma of 7 halves is 5 halves, gamma 5 halves. Gamma 5 halves is 3 halves, gamma 3 halves. And then times 1 half, gamma 1 half. And you can do the same with this one. So you subtract 1, you get 9 halves, gamma 9 halves, and keep going down 9, 5, uh, sorry, 9, 7, 5, 3, 1 times gamma a half. Now gamma a half, you recall, is root pi. So these two combine to give you a pi. And then when the dust settles on the arithmetic, you get 45 on 65,536. So they're quite cute formulae. You can use them to work out these nice trig integrals. Now Legendre also um, came up with this other formula, which I've called Theorem 5.1, which you can kind of think of as a sort of double angle formula, if you will, for the gamma function. Uh, it's got lots of little factors in it. There's a 2 root pi, 2 to the minus 2s, gamma 2s is gamma s, gamma s plus, plus a half. And this works for the real part of s bigger, bigger than 0. So as you, I'm going to prove this and I'll do a little example. We're going to use this one when, again when we're coming to this. We're trying to extend the zeta function across the whole of the complex plane. And this formula will come into play then. Uh, so as usual, what I'm going to do is I'm going to prove this for s real and s bigger than 0, and then just invoke analytic continuation, which is our usual trick for these, um, these things, because here s is a complex variable. If we can prove it works on the real line, at least for s bigger than 0, then we get the original statement by analytic continuation. 
So the proof of this is again, it's just um, fiddling around a bit with the um, notation. So we saw in the previous lemma, we had this fact, this was the reduplication formula. And I'm going to read, I'm going to just write that as we did before as b of s and t, the, this beta integral. Now I want to get rid of this, the cosine term here, so I'm going to put s to be a half, and that'll get rid of the cosine term. And I'm going to replace the, f, the t with s plus a half. And when I take a half of that, I'd simply end up with this nice integral for sines of to the 2s of theta d theta. So I let j be this integral. So let's just give that a name and call it j. And I'm going to make a change of variable at this point. I'm going to put u equals 2 theta in this integral. That will turn it into this one. As you can see by just a bit of simple calculations, it'll turn the pi on 2 into pi and so on. It collapses down to this. And then by symmetry, by symmetry, I've got a half of this integral. Well, that's just uh, a half of this one's going to be 0 to pi on 2 by symmetry. So I end up with this integral here. So this j then we've defined to be a half b of a half s plus a half. Because that's what we did. We defined j to be this, and that was equal to this quantity. On the other hand, it's also equal to, uh, sorry, on the other hand, if we can simplify this using the double angle formula. So this j is also equal to 2 sine theta cos theta to the 2s, naught to pi on 2 d theta. I can pull out a 2 to the 2s and just rewrite that, obviously. And this thing here is simply going to be, well, we need an extra factor of 2, so it's 2 to the 2s minus 1. This is just the beta integral, replacing s with s plus a half and t with s plus a half. So putting that all together, that gives me 1 half, v of a half s plus a half, is 2 to the 2s minus 1 times the beta integral s plus a half s plus a half. Now if you rewrite all these in terms of gammas, and using properties A and C above, the this double angle formula so-called falls out. So I'll leave you just to check the little bit of algebra required there. Before we move on, the um, I want to just show a little example of what you can do with this double angle formula. Because it enables us, in fact, to calculate uh, trig integrals with these, uh, with well, with fractional powers, at least with the powers of a half in here, which is quite nice. So, using the uh, reduplication formula, so I just um, add one to this and divide by two, I get gamma of nine quarters. Add 1 to this and divide by 2 is gamma of 7 quarters. And then the sum of these two is 4, so this is over twice gamma 4. Now the trouble is we don't know what the hell's gamma of 9 quarters. Well, I, can, I, I chose the numbers carefully here so that if this is s, then this is s plus a half. And so I can use that double angle, that, that double angle formula we just had, and I can write that as 2 root pi 2 to the minus 7 halves, that's our minus 2s, and then gamma of 7 halves, and on the bottom gamma of 4 is 3 factorial. Now again we can reduce this one down, if it's gamma of 7 halves that's 5 halves gamma 5 halves, and that reduces to 3 halves gamma of 3 halves times a half gamma of a half, as we saw before, and gamma of a half is root pi, so the two root pi's combine, and when you simplify all of the terms you get there, it turns out to be 5 root 2 pi and 256. So you can use these, I accept the numbers here are, are nicely rigged so that it came out nicely, but you can do 
treat some trig integrals with some fractional powers using this double angle formula. This is a very simple application of it. Okay, well, the our next little point that we want to do, I want to find a nice connection now between the gamma integral, the gamma function, and the zeta function, and that's what this next theorem 5.2 provides. So let, let us just enjoy what the theorem says. So if the real part of S is bigger than 1, it tells us a formula for multiplying zeta and gamma together. It gives us some connection between zeta and gamma, and it turns out to be this integral here. It's the integral of e to the t minus 1 inverse times t to the s minus 1 t. Again, this is going to be important in our quest to extend the zeta function to the whole of the complex plane. Now, the proof of it's a little bit um, fiddly, but it's not too that difficult. Firstly, we need to check that everything makes sense. This improper integral actually converges, because you see you've got, this is for the real part of S bigger than 1, because you see at t is 0, we've got some problems, and at t is infinity, it's imp it's improper. So we need to just be a bit careful about what we're doing here. So t is uh, real, so if t is near infinity, then e to the t minus 1 inverse is roughly, you can ignore the minus 1, this roughly gives you e to the minus t, and the integral of, from 1 to infinity of e to the minus t converges, and so that tells me then that this integral, this integral here, uh, converges. Actually, I should have said the integral of e to the minus t times t to the s minus 1 converges from going from 1 to infinity. So that's fine. So that converges uh, uniformly on any compact region with the real part of s bigger than 1. On the other hand, if t is near 0, then e to the t minus 1 to the minus 1 t to the s minus 1. Well, this thing here, if you think of the series of this, this is roughly t. And if t is near 0, this is roughly t, so this is 1 over t, and that gives me t to the s minus 2. And the integral from 0 to 1 of t to the s minus 2 dt is finite. And that tells me that this integral, the integral from 0 to 1 of this converges uniformly for real part of s bigger than 1. And so at the two extremes of 0 and infinity, everything's fine, so the integral from 0 to infinity, now v to the t minus 1 inverse t to the s minus 1 dt, represents an analytic function for real part of s bigger than 1. So again, by analytic continuation, it suffices to check the formula works, it makes sense for s is equal to x, where x is real and bigger than 1. So we come back to our integral, and we're going to do a little bit of um, some clever trickery on this, really. Firstly, I'm going to factor out e to the t out of the denominator. And so I can take that up the top as e to the minus t, and I'm left with 1 minus e to the minus t. Now, the if we peel off those two terms and look at 1 over 1 minus e to the minus t, we recognize that this is going to be the sum of a geometric series, which is 1 plus e to the minus t plus and so on, and that's the limit of this finite geometric series. So we're just taking the series of 1 over 1 minus e to the minus t and then writing that as a limit of a geometric series. Now I can. Now I'm doing the next step is the one where <clears throat> you may be a bit nervous because I'm going to interchange the limit and the integral. It's an, in, an improper integral and a limit. I'm going to interchange the two of those. I'll come back and talk about why that's valid in, in a moment. But let me just let us assume that we can just do that. So I interchange these two. 
I'm going to pull this one inside here and write this as a finite sum then, k equals 1 to n plus 1 of e to the minus kt, and I'm still left with t to the x minus 1 dt. Now, at the next stage, this is a finite sum, so I can interchange the sum and the integral without any problems, that's fine. That's all I'm doing there. And I'm going to make a change of variable here. I don't like the kt, I want just a single variable, so I'm going to put the u equal to kt in there. And so I do that, I get the limit as n goes to infinity times this sum of the integral, and when I make that change of variable, I get this in the integrand. Now, notice then, I can split this up as the sum. I'm going to get uh, k to the x in the denominator, so I can take that out as 1 on k to the x, that's independent of u, times the integral of e to the minus u, u to the x minus 1, and lo and behold, there is our lovely gamma integral. And there is our zeta function. It's just zeta of x. Now, the only thing you should be nervous about is the fact that I interchange the limit and the, the um, integral. And so let me say just a little bit about that. So just a little note here. The interchange of limit and integral can be justified by invoking the dominated convergence theorem from integration theory, which you may have seen in some calculus courses. So it says uh, the following, it says if you've got a function which is integrable, that is you can take its integral on some region and it's finite, and you've got a sequence of functions whose modulus is bounded by that g for all n, then if you've got that, if that sequence of functions tends to f of x, then the integral of that sequence of functions tends to the integral of f. That is, I'm saying that the limit of the integral of fn equals the integral of the limit of the fn's, and the limit of the fn's is f. That is, you're allowed to interchange integral and limit. And under the assumption that this goes to f of x for, well, for almost all x, except on a set of measure 0. So what I've done here is I've taken my fn to be this sum that we had, and I looked at the modulus of this, so I looked at the size of this, and we summed the uh, we, this, this is a geometric series in here, so I sum the geometric series to give me this. I can toss away the term, that term there. This is 1 minus this is less than this. And this was the G in, my, in this dominated convergence theorem. And we know that the integral of this one converges. So this function here, this G, was integrable on naught to infinity. The size of our fn's is less than g, and that meant we could interchange the limit and, in, and uh, in integral for this sequence of functions. Now this, this integral that we had arises in statistical mechanics, of all things, and is sometimes known as the, the Bose-Einstein uh, integral. Simple example of this one, if we've got this integral here, well, by our formula, this is zeta of 4, gamma of 4. Uh, now, zeta of 4 is pi to the 4th on 90, it's one of the values of zeta, and gamma of 4 is 3 factorial, and that collapses down to pi to the 4th on 15. Now, in our next section, we're going to develop um, the functional equation for the zeta function, and that's going to enable us to take an analytic extension of zeta across the whole of the complex plane.